another pastor has been caught with his pants down, literally. Pastor Travner Smith of Venue Church was caught by parishioners at his home in his boxers with a female co-worker who was wearing a towel. Once again, a mega church leader has fallen. And once again, believers demonstrate that while they claim to have superior morals, their behavior is no different from anyone else. This pastor has the most hilarious excuse for why he had no pants. Pastor Smith's own sermon from four years ago predicts his behavior to a T. Let's have a chat. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining me and an extra special thank you to my wonderful patrons and channel members. I was alerted to this story by my friend Chris Atley, atheist pastor. A link to his video on this topic is in the description and if it worked, it's a card up here. Prior to seeing Chris's video, I had never heard of Travner Smith or his church, Venue Church, despite it being a mega church only about a two-hour drive from me in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Pardon me, boy. Is that the Chattanooga choo-choo? Yes. Venue sprung up quickly, being founded in 2012 and going from a small church of 150 in 2014 to having over 2,000 attending every Sunday now, thanks primarily to the work of Colt Chandler Helton, a now former staffer. Helton posted this video on Facebook, where he identifies the couple in the video as Smith and a woman who is not Smith's wife. Helton resigned shortly after posting this. He also spoke with reporters and alleges several other acts of misconduct on Smith's part. He reports that Venue has zero elders or accountability. He says staff were told that there was no money, but Smith had a new car every few weeks as well as exotic dogs and shoe and jersey collections. According to one news source, Smith and his wife own two homes valued at nearly $950,000 combined, and the church property is valued at $4.9 million. According to Helton, the theology at Venue has shifted often, and the church eventually began promoting prosperity gospel. He says he witnessed physical and mental abuse by leaders at the church. He reports witnessing frequent periods when the lead pastor would have alone time with females on the worship team and in the congregation. According to the Christian Post, Helton was not alone in his views as eight employees quit after the video of Smith's kiss was posted. Smith filed for divorce from his wife in May, about the same time that the video of the kiss became public. Destiny Santos, who attended the church for five years and served on the security team, told the Times Free Press that the church carefully curated its online image. She said she was once asked to let down her curly hair for a picture so that the church would appear to be more racially diverse. Santos also said that Smith would discredit people who left the church, saying that people were either with venue or they were part of the devil's move against it. Anyone that spoke bad about him or the church went into this watch list with code names and explanations as to why they're not allowed. As a result of her experience at Venue, Santos said she is struggling to discern what is real about her Christian experience. Indeed, there's nothing like realizing how much of it is all fake to get one questioning whether any of it is true. Four years ago, Pastor Smith preached a sermon entitled Relationship Goals, The Danger of Uninvited Guests. That sermon would prove prophetic. His Bible text is the wedding at Cana. It was in verse 3 when Mary comes to Jesus and she says this. She says, Jesus, it's going downhill. It's a disaster. It feels awkward. Things are different because we had a wine. The wine's gone, Jesus, and I need you to do something about it. And here's what Jesus is not saying. Hey, you need wine in your life to be happy. Jesus is saying this because in the Bible, wine is a metaphor for joy. 
And what is being expressed here is it's a picture of relationship. And he's trying to help us see that even though we get in these relationships that bring health and they bring joy and they bring life and they bring excitement and they bring satisfaction, if we are not careful, a lot of times they end up running out of joy. And the thing that once blessed you now feels like a burden to you. It used to bring joy, but now you feel stuck. Is that what it was, Pastor Smith? You ran out of joy with your wife, so you had to seek it elsewhere. If you're lacking joy, it's because you're leaking joy. Maybe this was the real reason Pastor Smith and his friend were unclothed. They were leaking joy. And now it's just gone. The reason it's gone is because people had been dipping and withdrawing from it without any deposits. Oh, that was what you were doing? You were making a joy deposit? And oh, I know Jesus! Fix this thing! This isn't a miracle situation. This is a natural situation. And if you would have done the right thing on the front end of this party, you wouldn't be begging me to fix your mistake now. Which is really what we do, is we get ourselves into these situations that we never should have, and then we beg for God to fix them. More prophetic words have never been preached. He needs to join Cindy Jacobs' generals. Because God is saying, when you are a real mature Christian, you don't need miracle living, you can live in principle-based living. You don't need me to rescue your messed up, jacked up relationship because you didn't get in a mess, messed up, jacked up relationship in the first place because you did something right on the front end. And pray tell, Pastor Smith, where are you now out in the wilderness seeking a miracle to restore your ministry? But I want you to know that this don't concern me. You could fix this one yourself. You can get it to a place of joy. Because I intended for you to have joy. Is that what you were doing? Seeking the joy that you know God intended for you? It's cool that he had to make more wine, but here's the question I asked myself. Why did they run out in the first place? And it was a big deal. So the families that decided to have these seven-day wedding ceremonies, can I tell you something? It was not normal for them to run out of wine because they knew what was on the line. So why did they run out of wine if they knew how important it was? The only logical explanation I have, the only thing that even makes sense to me as I read the text and think through this, is that the only way they could be out of wine is if somehow there were uninvited guests drinking it. The joy's gone because there's people at the wedding that were never on the list. The joy is drained because there are people drinking from the source of joy who weren't on the list in the first place, so there was never enough joy put in the basket to sustain them through the duration of the party. Was this married woman that you were with on the list, Pastor Smith? Did you drain your wife's party? And now, everything's on the line because the leader of this wedding didn't take it seriously enough to guard his list. Anything you say can and will be used against you. Anything you say will be held against you. God knows that in order to get to your purpose, you have to be surrounded by people that he intended to be on your guest list. How does Pastor Smith treat the uninvited guests in his own marriage? Why, he gets naked with them when his wife isn't there, of course. Last November, volunteers of the Venue Church paid a surprise visit to Pastor Travner Smith at his house, but discovered the pastor wearing only his boxers with a married church employee in a towel. The unnamed woman was married to another staff member at Venue, according to the Daily Mail. When asked why they were clothed in this fashion, Smith explained that they had made chili, and spilled some on their clothes. Why, of course, if I spill chili on my clothes, I strip and put on a towel instead, don't you? 
Do you know how you can tell if someone in your life is an uninvited guest? It's because every time you leave their presence, you feel drained instead of feeling filled up. The people who are on your list are supposed to fill you up and add to you. They're not supposed to drain you and take from you. And so you have to recognize, no matter how much you like them, no matter how much you're connected to them, if you don't have a ring on your finger for them and said, I do, or if you were not born into their bloodline, everybody else can be X'd off your list. Um, Pastor, you said I do to someone else, and so did she. Anything you say will be held against you. But eventually, when you leak out, you ain't got nothing more to offer. Indeed. Here's the problem with that. If you allow uninvited guests that are drains in your life, they will be draining mercy out of your life that was intended for people who are actually on your list. Which is why you show up at night and you grouch at your husband and you yell at your kids. Why? Because you extended all your mercy to people who weren't on your list. And now you have none left over for the people who are supposed to be there. Like your wife and your congregation. You're nice to the person at work who could care less about you and you can't even look at your wife when you go home. I couldn't make this up if I tried. Number two is this, is that uninvited guests desire a different path than you. Do you, can I, oh man, I know I'm already in your stuff, but can I get a little bit deeper in the kitchen? Can I, it amazes me. Y'all hear my heart's out of love, right? One person said yes. (laughs) You on my list, girl. (laughs) Do y'all know I'm saying this out of love? I have a heart of love, okay? Because we have uninvited people on our guest list and they're drinking up all of our mercy out of us. Because I've just dealt with you for eight hours over in your freaking cubicle and you got some freaking attitude against me and you look over at me again, I'm going to jack slap that look off your face. But now that I go home, I ain't got no mercy for you when you showed up five minutes late, honey. I'm going to smile and be nice to her all day, but I ain't got a fake with you, so I'll just be a jerk to you. Because I ain't got no mercy left. Because I got uninvited guests at my party, and now I'm empty of wine, and this ain't even fun anymore. Do you know what we got to do? Got to start marking some people off our list. Look at your neighbor and say, start marking some people off your list. So is this Pastor Smith's response to being caught in a compromising position? Is he repenting? Is he marking this woman off his list? Is he apologizing to his congregation? Have we heard any mea culpas? No. He's going on a sabbatical to get closer to God. Sure you are, Pastor Smith. Is there a certain naked woman coming with you on this sabbatical? Smith has announced on Instagram that he will be back in a month. The church Facebook page makes no mention of his absence, and the church website appears to have been hijacked as clicking on the link takes you to a privacy warning page. I do feel bad for Smith's church. Maybe I shouldn't. The church seems to have endorsed the pastor's indiscretions by continuing to allow Smith to preach, according to their Facebook page, up until January 3rd, long after the church members found him in November. His departure from the church only came when news of his affair began to reach the major media and it became public. Smith then announced his sabbatical on January 5th. The church Facebook page makes no mention of the affair or of Smith's leave of absence. Christians tell me that I steal my morality from God an argument made popular by Frank Turek. I have to point out the absurdity of such a claim because morality isn't limited in quantity. To steal something, you must deprive another of their rights to that property. In the case of intellectual property, like music, when you steal it, what you are stealing isn't the music itself, but the owner's right to sell the music. The profit the artist would have made had you bought the music instead of stealing it. I don't think Christians are making the claim that God sells morality. 
Thus, moral atheists are depriving God of the tithe money that he would have received had they gone to church and tithed and received their morals in exchange. The only other way that atheists could steal God's morals would be if morality was a limited quantity. When atheists steal God's morals, he doesn't have enough left to give to Christians. On the other hand, maybe Turk is right. Maybe that is why there are so many sex scandals and other acts of immorality in the church, because the atheists have stolen all the morality. With atheism on the rise, every moral act by an atheist causes a believer to commit an immoral act, as they have now lost their morality. Let's keep it up, atheists. Act morally, show kindness, and let the sin run rampant in the church as they run out of morality. Or maybe Christians should just face up to the fact that morals and moral behavior have nothing to do with God beliefs. They have to do with character and values. There are believers with good moral values, and there are atheists with good moral values. And of course, there are atheists and believers who can't keep it in their pants when appropriate as well. Smith's excuse when the volunteers found him should have been, an atheist came and stole their clothes. The volunteers didn't believe the chili story. Maybe they would have bought the atheist story. Live your life 